A very good evening to you and many thanks for joining us on The Big Story tonight. My name is Sharon Momani. Now, a battle is being played out around a resource-rich Lamo County. In one corner, ecologists and climate change campaigners warn that coal mining is a death sentence to many, even beyond Lamo County. In the other corner, mining giants and politicians who argue that mine, uh, mining will be a vital, uh, will be vital rather for Kenya's economic success. Now, many developed countries are abandoning coal as a source of energy. A fortnight ago, four U.S. senators who toured Kenya wrote to the Africa Development Bank, petitioning it not to fund the 200 billion shillings Lamu coal project. Tonight on The Big Story, we seek to get to the bottom of this spirited opposition to what is perceived as a renewable source of energy. And for this conversation, I have Dr. John Musingi, who is an Environment Studies lecturer at the University of Nairobi. I also have Omar Mohamed El Mawi, who is the campaign coordinator for Decolonize Lamu. And from our Mombasa studio, I will be joined by the executive director of Haki Africa, Khalid Hussein. But before we get to that studio conversation, I want now to cross over live to our lead reporter, Sophia Wanuna, who will be giving us context to how uh, this debate is where it is right now. And a good evening to you, Sophia. Good evening, Sharon. The year 2015 is when this Lamu coal plant was to be set up, but it has faced several hurdles, huge opposition coming from the local community there, as well as environmentalist uh, activists, this battle moving to court, and unsuccessfully so, so far. Okio Mtata was one of the figures we saw in court alongside uh, the Kenya Human Rights Commission that were enjoined as well. However, the case was thrown out in a technicality in, a, in that the judge finding that the issues they were raising could have been raised in a timely fashion, that when these advertisements were put out to kick off this project, those timelines allowed for objections and participation to happen. Uh, the uh, requisite timelines, however, they did not. And so the, uh, uh, the kind of solace they were seeking, if you like, from the courts at the time then was seen to be out of time. But huge concerns, 200 billion uh, shillings a project that the government has argued will help spiral Kenya's uh, economy. It will also cater to future needs in as far as her energy needs and uh, capacity will be required as the country continues to grow. However, as we stand now, Kenya's uh, demand standing at 1,700 megawatts, it's producing 2,300 megawatts. So you can see there about a reserve of 500 megawatts or so, which the government argues is a reserve that's important to cater uh, for emergency kind of scenarios when you see uh, these major providers uh, fall short. Uh, however, this would put Kenyans in a situation where every year, and it was an argument that was made in court by Okio Mtata and others, 37 billion shillings. Once the project kicks off, Kenyans will have to pay whether or not the coal uh, plant in Lamu, when it's set up, is producing coal, because that is uh, part of the deal that Kenya has gotten into with China. Now, this goes against that uh, Paris Climate Accord that Kenya signed into. So Kenya and other countries that are part of this accord are promising and, uh, you know, giving the word that they would work towards greener energy, and that is what Kenya has relied on for many years now, hydropower, geothermal power, solar power areas we've been exploring as well. And so the call has been why not invest and continue to tap into these sources? Because also we've seen international and local investors come out to say we can and are willing and have the capacity to invest in these greener uh, areas of energy. However, because the government has already come into this agreement, that has been shelved, saying then if we allow for this kind of other investments, it would mean more than capacity. But already as we stand, many of the environmentalists are speaking to a, an environmental uh, lawyer just a few moments ago, and he was saying we already have more than we need. This particular uh, Lamu coal plant, the government has already have, had to ask for a scale down of the capacity of energy it was uh, to bring out, because on further uh, review of the energy in terms of megawatts Kenya would be getting, it was going to be more than double what Kenya needs. So there's huge concern as to whether 
this is needed in the first place. Important to note as well, Sharon, is that for five to ten years, uh, Kenya will be importing this coal from South Africa. That's before she's able to set up a rail line between uh, Lamu and Kitui County because Kitui is where this uh, coal is uh, largely generated from. So you can see the economical downfall in as far as just being able to uh, import this product from South Africa all the way to the country for a period of five to ten years before Kenya can uh, develop that capacity. But the biggest concern with environmentalists, you mentioned those protests that were held about two weeks ago is that this is not good for the environment. It does not help with the conversation that the world is now having around climate change, that greener energy is the way to go. We've already as a country started seeing and feeling the implications uh, of, of climate change, the flooding witness, those flash floods. And so coal producing carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide is not good for the environment. Health-wise also the implication of that, especially to the local communities, even the economies uh, in Lamu County their fishermen there, they've raised concern about the implication it will have on them as well. But this uh, sort of claims uh, and sort of issues that have been uh, raised are not uh, clearly uh, forming what is informing uh, the decisions that have been made so far around the Lamu coal plant that the government appears to be very headstrong on going forward with this project despite uh, the numerous challenges and issues that have been raised uh, on this. Uh, also important to note, Sharon, is Lamu is a UNESCO recognized and listed heritage sites, so tourist attraction, but also protection under UNESCO. And so the kind of repercussions that this kind of a plant being set up would bring, and that so far it appears there hasn't been a real strong argument uh, for why Kenya needs this when she has already... Uh, these are the avenues she could continue to tap into and invest to ensure uh, that Kenya does not have the shortfalls that the government is saying it's trying to mitigate in the coming years. But it appears so far we'll have to wait and see how this plays out, Sharon. Thanks. Here, just painting a very clear picture of what this discussion and this debate concerning the proposed coal power plant in Lamu has been looking at, uh, looking like this far. And just to have this conversation with me in studio, I'll introduce my guest again to you. I'm joined by Dr. John Musingi here in our Mombasa Road studios. He is an environment studies lecturer at the University mm -hmm. of Nairobi. I'm also joined by Omar Mohamed El Mawi who is the campaign coordinator for Decolonize Lamu. You have seen them uh, really uh, spearheading that campaign against that project. And from our Mombasa studio, we have the executive director of Haki Africa, Khalid Hussein. Many thanks, gentlemen, for uh, joining us for this very important conversation tonight. And I just want to start with you, Dr. Musingi. If you could paint a picture of really what the concerns are, the scale of what we are looking at uh, from an environmental conservation point of view. I don't know, Dr. Musingi, if you can hear me. We want to start by just painting a picture from uh, that point of view as an environmentalist. What are the concerns that this project brings? Um, the concerns are that um, are basically environmental concerns. Um, because, um, as you have said, Lamu, you know, is not the right place for for coal plant because the environment there is quite sensitive. Uh, that's one of the issues. The other issue is coal is generally a dirty um, you know, source of energy. And therefore, there is really not any convincing uh, reason why we should be turning um, into using coal to produce electricity. Because as we know, um, if you look at our energy demand, we can still uh, satisfy it using renewable sources of energy. So essentially, coal is a dirty source of energy. And many countries in the world are now moving away from coal. So there's no reason why we should be going back uh, when everybody else is leaving coal. 
Right, and, and I just want to stay with you, uh, Dr. Musingi, because uh, this concerns, especially as, uh, about the emissions from the project and what it would do to the environment, has been countered because they say that the kind of uh, technology that will be used to produce energy there is advanced technology. Uh, that's more of a... There's, you can never really eliminate um, the, you know, the dangerous gases, 100 percent. Perhaps they will reduce, you know, by a good percentage. But still, you know, nobody else has managed to eliminate all these dangerous gases which are emitted when you burn coal. Because as you know that um, when you burn coal, almost all the gases which are found in the soil are emitted. And therefore, um, um, there is no exactly 100% system that can eliminate these dangerous gases. So we should be able to differentiate, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, something trying to uh, make people not, you know, uh, be concerned. And the reality, the reality is uh, there is no technology which can eliminate coal uh, dangerous gases 100%. And uh, I want to bring in Mr. El Mawi, who has been coordinating the campaigns at uh, the decolonized Lamu. And we, the, the, the debate really has been now about cost and benefit, with proponents saying that um, effectively this will be, you know, eventually end up boosting the country's economy and then improving the lives of people, cost versus benefit. Is that so? Uh, thanks, Sharon, for the question, and that's a really good question. Um, first, I'll just start by saying that I'm coming from the decolonized campaign, not necessarily decolonized Lamu, because we are looking at coal uh, as a national issue in Kenya. So it's coal energy sector in Kenya. Um, in terms of the question and whether, you know, benefits vis-a-vis -vis costs, um, I think it's a good question to ask and look uh, at the benefits, if any, that are going to come from this plant, uh, specifically here talking about the Lamu coal power plant. Um, if you look at during the uh, construction of the plant, you're going to generate about uh, 1,400 jobs. Um, when you look, at, you look at during operation, then it's going to generate about 400 jobs. Um, this plant is going to affect the environment, it's going to affect uh, the sea. Um, and if you look at just Lamu itself and the fishermen that we have, according to uh, even the recent ruling that was made at the High Court, uh, they recognize that we have about uh, 5,000 to 6,000 fishermen. So you are actually affecting 6,000 fishermen directly, um, and then you're just benefiting 400 people. Mm -hmm. um, if you look, for example, at the technical know-how that's needed for running of these coal power plants, um, I've, I was just reading uh, news just a little a while ago, and actually most of these people are going to come from outside Kenya, because this is the first coal power plant in Kenya and in East Africa at large. Um, so we're not really going to benefit. It's going, it, it makes a lot of sense for the project proponents, uh, because they're using uh, less money to generate electricity, and they're going to get lots of profits. Uh, so it makes a business sense to them. Uh, but in the other side, when you look at the external costs that are going to be faced by the community, uh, by the people of Kenya in terms of the 36 or 37 billion that's going to be paid in terms of idle capacity, uh, it's going to reflect in our power bills. Um, so it's going to affect us while uh, in the same time uh, it's affecting the businesses and uh, the project proponents. Right. And I want to stay with you, Mr. Elmawi. There has been a lot of opposition, uh, not just yours, but many other uh, organizations joining forces, you know, uh, just to try to stop this project from taking off. Maybe just talk to us about how that campaign has been and uh, you know why it's not been successful so far because all we hear is that it's just a matter of time before the project kicks off. Um, to be honest, I think when Sophia started, let's stand correct if it's not her, uh, she said that there was a case that was filed at the High Court which was dismissed. Um, that's true. But we also have a case that's filed at the National Environmental Tribunal which is still progressing. Um, and actually that's the case that has been able to stop the coal power plant thus far because uh, if we didn't have anything uh, in the process, then these people will actually have started constructing by now. Um, the case is still ongoing. Um, so people, you know, when this coal power plant started, 
um, many of us didn't actually understand uh, what really coal is, uh, the effect that it comes with, uh, and even most of us had not even seen coal in our lives uh, since we were born. Um, so we had to do a lot of sensitization with both communities uh, and environmental organizations in Kenya. We actually did support uh, when we were back with Sevlamu to take some of the community members and organization uh, representatives to all the way to South Africa to see how coal power plants are, how the people living near coal power plants are actually, uh, the conditions that they're living in, um, and whether at all they are, they actually people are benefiting from these uh, development projects, so to speak. And uh, I want to bring in now Mr. Khalid Hussein uh, for joining us from our Mombasa uh, studios. And we have seen the proponents and even the drivers of this project speaking about the mitigation measures that have been put in place, you know, just to mitigate against the negative effects it would have on the environment and on human health. Is this not enough? No, um, thank you very much, Sharon, and uh, particularly KTN for giving us the opportunity to speak about this uh, very dreadful uh, project that the government of Kenya is working on. Uh, first of all, let is, let, let's make it very clear that there is no clean coal. There is no such thing as clean coal. That's a myth. It's a lie. You cannot uh, produce coal at the same time, um, have any sort of mitigation to make it clean. Uh, coal is poisonous, coal is dangerous, coal kills. Everywhere across the world where coal has been produced, it has had devastating effects, not just on the environment, not just on, uh, on the people themselves, but, you know, on, uh, across the, uh, the, the countries that they have had this project. And uh, then we speak about coal technology, that then technology comes in to make it slightly better. And that is what, uh, you know, the proponents have been pegging the argument on, that, you know, other developments, other economies really banked a lot on cheap fuel and cheap energy to drive their economies, then that we are still a developing country and need actually to tap into this potential of getting cheap power. That's true, and uh, we totally agree with, uh, with, with that argument, that we actually need to produce more power. First of all, let's understand that currently Kenya produces 2,200 megawatts of power, and our consumption so far is 1,900. So at, as we stand currently, we are spending less than what we are producing, so to, to address that issue. Secondly, yes, it's true that we need more energy, but we have many other alternative sources of clean energy. You know, uh, we have geothermal. Kenya has like the seventh largest geothermal factory in, in, in the world. We have uh, endless wind in Kenya. We have sunshine. We have so many other options that can actually produce much better energy, you know, with l least uh, uh, environmental effects. But why use coal energy? It doesn't make sense, you know. Article 42 of the Constitution of Kenya is very clear that every Kenyan has the right to clean and healthy environment. Article 43 of the same constitution is very clear on the rights of socioeconomic and, you know, uh, uh, freedoms of the people of Kenya. Coal energy is not going in any way going to support the enjoyment of these rights. As uh, my brother Omar has explained, these practices have been shown across the world how they affect the local communities. We're talking of health conditions such as premature babies being born in, in areas where this, such kind of plants are there. If you look at uh, Mui in Kitui where they are, they are proposing to mine uh, this uh, coal from, Already it has affected the, 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 the environment within that area. The water has already been affected by the coal, and it's already poisoning you know, animals and plants in that area. So in every way you look at it, Sharon, um, coal is going to really affect not just these areas, Lamo and Kitui, but actually it's going to spread as far as Garissa, as far as Lamo, I mean, uh, sorry, Kwale in the south coast, and even to the interior in areas around Nairobi and, and, and such places. That's why last week we held a huge demonstration in Nairobi. We were there to talk to the people, to raise awareness so that they understand that there is a right to a clean and healthy environment. And as Kenyans, we have to come out to protect this particular right. It's very hypocritical for the government to organize a huge event in Kwale in, in, in commemoration of the World Environment Day. Yet that same government is actually working to set up a coal plant in Lamu that will have devastating effects on the environment, not just of Lamu and Kitui, but of the whole country.
Right. And uh, Dr. Musingi, an environment uh, impact assessment was conducted on this project. And let's just talk about the stipulated limits for some of these emissions, yeah? Uh, even looking at what international kind of standards advocate for. Now, the Kenyan limit, I understand, for nitro oxides emissions is about 510 milligrams per meter cubic. And uh, what the project says is that the coal power plant, uh, the emissions will be, of this particular gas, will be less than that, uh, 450 milligrams per cubic uh, meter, which is also, uh, these standards are also as par with the International Finance Corporation. So then the question becomes, where then is the problem if they are within uh, the stipulated limits, if not below? Um, I would go to specifics on... Um on copper, as you are saying, um, but um, well, I read that um, environmental impact assessment. Uh, but one thing you need to know is uh, environmental impact assessments in Kenya now have become more of uh, formalities, just documents that are being done so that um, you know the paperwork can be you know can be in order. So um, if you read that. Um, uh, environmental impact assessment, you notice so many issues are not really then just being grossed, grossed over. So it's not really comprehensive uh, document. And you realize that, you know, there was also a lot of influence on, um, you know, on the part of, um, um, you know, you have to realize the proponent uh, is very much well connected. So even the EIA, as you say, as we say, um, it will, uh, it will uh, cause uh, what? You know, if, if, if these people are conflicted persons, because you realize who is paying the, the person who is doing the environmental impact assessment. It is arm power, who are the owners of the project, who are the proponents. So basically, you cannot rely on that environmental impact assessment. Um, it's really, um, it's not, it cannot help much. Um, and when you look at even the public consultation that was done in Lamu, again, um, not so many people were involved. Uh, many of those um, days which were scheduled for public participation were on Fridays when, and you realize uh, Lamu, uh, most of the people are Muslims, you know, so they did not participate. So everything was more or less like tailors to suit, you know, um, a particular agreed, uh, you know, outcome. So really, that EIA is not really reliable, and it cannot help uh, the people of Lamu. And I just want to stay with you, uh, Dr. Mustingi. Um, another argument is that this affordable power, uh, you know, would limit the use of charcoal and firewood as a means of energy. And some would say that, you know, firewood and charcoal also actually have, you know, they, 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 they emit carbons which are unfiltered into the environment, mm. and that, that would be even worse for the environment. Yeah, yeah. Charcoal, <laughs> charcoal emits um, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Now, coal emits almost all the gases found in, um, you know, in the world, in the periodic table, if you use the, the chemical, uh, you know, uh, terms. Because um, when the formation of coal is through putting pressure on, on uh, organic materials underground, so you find all the gases around there form that, that coal. So basically, what, this is very different, you know. Charcoal is basically um, something that you burn a tree and what we get is only carbon monoxide and carbon, um, and carbon dioxide. While in uh, coal, almost all the gases are found uh, in that, in that uh, you know, in coal. Of course, we realize that we are saying that we need to stop charcoal burning uh, in Kenya, uh, and perhaps coal could, could help. But really, um, this is not the way to go. Uh, that argument doesn't go far because we can still get energy from other sources, uh, even for domestic use, you know. There are other ways. Already now people are using briquette, so we don't have to go to coal because um, I've, uh, if you read the literature which is available, you realize, for example, people who live near the coal uh, plants, 
their life expectancy is about like 45 years, you know. So that is the situation that we are welcoming. Now, when you look at again in Lamu, um, look at really the situation in Lamu. Um, it's a very sensitive environment, really. Um, and I was saying that because Kenyans are now getting awakened, these guys, uh, they may find it very difficult in the future because they, may, they will be taken to court over diseases that may arise from these coal uh, emissions, um, pollution. So that will mean they may need to take a very um, insurance that will maybe compensate victims that might be affected by the emissions from the coal plant. So this is really unnecessary. Why don't we have to do it? You know, we have so much energy, uh, clean energy. Geothermal is still, you know, uh, solar is now becoming very competitive. Wind is still now becoming very competitive. Do we have to go to coal? It's completely unnecessary. And uh, Mr. Elmawe, the government has said that the main reason we are focusing on this having affordable uh, you know, and reliable energy that would be produced from coal is to fuel Vision 2030. And uh, the question would be then, when we speak about clean energy and that being the uh, you know, prudent way to go, do we have the capacity to produce enough clean energy to fuel Vision 2030? Um, yes, we do. Um, the government has been bragging just a few, a few, a year or so ago that we have the capacity to generate about 10,000 megawatts of electricity through geothermal. Um, just the other day, we turned down a Swedish farm that wanted to generate about 600 megawatts of electricity using offshore wind. Um, and actually, our reason for turning them down is that we have more energy than we need. So if we don't need 600 megawatts, I'm finding, finding it hard to understand why we need 1,000 megawatts. Um, in terms of uh, renewable energy vis-a-vis uh, you know, uh, pushing through uh, our Vision 2030 projects. Um, if you look at the projects, um, and you know, we've we've actually looked at these projects and talked to experts, energy experts, including them is uh, a former chair of the Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, Mr. Hinpal Jabal. Um, actually, he's been very vocal in stating that actually the projections that we are having for these projects are quite far-fetched, um, and we are actually trying to um, say that we need more energy than we need, but actually uh, that's not the case. Um, and uh, since uh, at least way back since 2000, 2000s going forward, we've just been uh, improving in about 6% in terms of uh, energy demand every year. But then now we are almost projecting that we're going to move almost 15, 20% uh, of the energy that we need. Um, the, the bad thing is that um, we're actually having examples of renewable energy that are being generated. We have the Electrocana wind, uh, which is the, uh, the biggest uh, wind farm in Africa, generating about 300 megawatts of electricity. Um, this project has been uh, constructed. It's already it's ready to come uh, into the grid. But then the government has not yet even built the transmission line, um, and we're about to start paying fines in terms of idle capacity. Um, so I, will, I find it hard to understand uh, why we can't even utilize the sources uh, and the energy that's already in place uh, to, to grow as, so, as, as we want to, uh, rather than just continue uh, you know, building more and more projects uh, without even having the demand uh, for that case. Right. Fantastic. I um, want to take a short break here on the big story, but don't go too far because this a very important conversation will be going on in just a few minutes. Don't go too far.